Morning, church. We had opportunity Friday to go out to Eddie Warrior uh, to do our monthly baptisms, and we were privileged to baptize 14 inmates into Christ. That makes uh, 191 this year so far, baptized in our work at Eddie Warrior. God really continues to bless that, and again, as always, if you'd like to help us with that work, we could sure use your help, whether you go out on Fridays or on Sundays, the third and fourth Sunday, we'll go out and conduct services. We would love to have your help. We can always use it. Also, as Mark mentioned, and as so many have mentioned already, it is Veterans Day. And thank God for those of you who have served our country and uh, defended our freedom. You know, when we moved here, that national cemetery out there was a whole lot smaller than what it is now. In the last several years, thousands of men who served this country faithfully, World War II, the Korean War, have begun to pass from this life and have gone on. Uh, we owe those men and those who fought in all those wars since, and women, uh, a, a great debt. If you're a veteran, would you please stand? Please, if you're a veteran. God bless you and thank you, thank you. Last week we talked about what happened in the Garden of Eden with the tree of good and evil. How God placed that tree right in the center of the garden, made it beautiful, made its fruit attractive, and told Adam and Eve, don't eat it. You can eat of any other tree in the garden you want to, including the tree of life, as often as you want to. Don't eat that tree. And of course, what did Adam and Eve do? Drawn by the devil, their attention drawn to that tree. They both eat of it. And as a result of that, sin comes into the world and death through sin. Now, what's the answer to the sin problem? Through the years, I think, in the minds of, of, of many people, the answer to the sin problem has been law. How do you deal with evil? How do you deal with sin? You pass laws. Uh, I, I've been fascinated, for instance, by all the recent discussion and palaver that's gone on about uh, making medical marijuana legal. Uh, it gets made legal and immediately the war start over what kind of laws are gonna be in place regulating the sale and the usage of that medical marijuana. Because that's how humans deal with problems like that. We make laws. The problem is, does law solve the sin problem? And what I wanna argue, and I believe what scripture argues, is no, it doesn't. Never has and it never will. And if we fall back on law, we fall back on something that's never going to support us, that's never going to provide the answer to the sin problem. It's got to come from a different source. But this morning, I want us to spend some time thinking about law. In particular, um, the law of God. Now, let me begin by just briefly noting that there are three ways in which the term law will be used in Scripture. Uh, first, it will be used of a repeatable principle. We, for instance, talk about the law of gravity, okay? It's a repeatable principle. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2, Paul will make reference to a very important principle that we'll come back to later in this series of lessons when he says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death says, and started in the garden, you sin, you die. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Okay? Paul says, there is a principle, there is a law that is higher than that one. A law that overcomes that one. It is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is an incredible blessing, brethren. But law will sometimes speak of a repeatable principle. Other times... Man's law will be referenced when it speaks of law. For instance, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1, 
Paul, they're talking about brethren duking it out with each other in a court of law. And he says, you ought not to be doing that. But he says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? And of course, there he's talking about man's court and man's law. And so the law also can refer to the law of man. Now, the majority of the time, not all the time, but the majority of the time, when law is spoken of in scripture, reference is going to be made to the law of Moses. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 9 will specifically speak as he's talking there to, to the Corinthian brethren that it is written, speaking of this passage, in the law of Moses. And he'll just call it the law of Moses. Um, there are some who say the easiest way to think about this is big L law and little L law. Big L law being the law of Moses, little L law being the law of man. I think that's a little oversimplistic. Some translations try to reflect that, others don't. But the bottom line is, in scripture, you've got repeatable principles, you've got man's law, and then you've got the law given by God uh, to Israel that we call the law of scripture calls, the law of Moses. Now, today in this lesson, most of the references I wanna make are to the law of Moses because that was a law given by God. And what I wanna do first of all is, is think about what the law of Moses did. And then I want us to look at very importantly what the law of Moses could not do. Because this is important in considering law in reference to your salvation and mine. What did the law of Moses do? Well, first of all, it did regulate behavior. And that is one of the purposes of law, isn't it? Is to regulate behavior. Um, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. What are they? They are a series of ten thou shalt and thou shalt not designed to do what? To regulate people's behavior. You will obey your father and your mother. You will not steal. Okay? Regulating behavior. Secondly, uh, you'll find examples of dietary laws, for instance, in Leviticus chapter 11. Um, the Jews being told, um, no catfish, no shrimp, can't have a ham sandwich, okay? There are certain animals that are gonna be considered unclean and you cannot consume them, all right? Other animals will be clean and you can't eat them. Now, why is God doing this? I don't wanna go into it. I believe it's, he's teaching his people about holiness and separation. But the bottom line is he regulates their behavior through these dietary laws. That's a couple of examples of how law regulates our behavior. And of course, in multiple ways, don't we see that today? From traffic laws to zoning laws to you name it, behavior is regulated by law. Now, a second way in which the law of Moses functioned was to establish clear boundaries for conduct. Um, a couple of examples right out of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. <coughs> How many gods could Israel worship? One. You shall have no other gods before me. What's he doing? He's drawing a clear boundary, isn't he? And he's saying, I don't want you worshiping Chemosh. I don't want you worshiping Molech. I don't want you worshiping Baal or Astarte. You will worship me and me alone. Puts up this wall, this boundary, and says, I am it. I'm the only one that you are to worship. A little bit later in chapter 20, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Again, what's he doing? Putting a boundary up around his name. He's saying, don't you blaspheme me. Don't you use my name like a curse word. Don't you take my name and promise that you're going to do something and then not do it. Don't you take, don't you use my name in vain. I want my name to be held as sacred in your mouth. Okay. He's drawing a boundary around his name. Thirdly, uh, the law delineated consequences for disobedience. Uh, Exodus chapter 22, verse one. If I steal your sheep, I gotta pay back four. If I steal your ox, I gotta pay back five. Okay, there's a consequence. If I'm caught stealing what you've got, 
I have to pay back four or five times what I stole. Very clear consequences delineated for breaking the law. In Leviticus chapter 26, a scary passage, by the way, reflective of what will be found later on in Deuteronomy 28 through 32, and what's called the covenant of blessing and cursing. But here early in the law, Leviticus 26, God says, let me tell you something. If you're faithful to me, if you follow me, I'm going to bless you. But if you break my laws, if you don't follow me, I want to tell you here are the consequences that you're going to face because of it. And those consequences are frightening. He's very clear about what the consequences will be. That was a part of the law, was to delineate those consequences for disobedience. And also, very importantly, it was the law that identified sin. Now, in the, uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 7 and verse 7, Paul will write, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. You say, wait a minute. No, how do you know the thou shalt and the thou shalt not? Because you're taught them. And that's how you come to know that it's wrong to blaspheme, that it's wrong to commit idolatry. That it's wrong to do things like this. Why? Because the law identifies that as sin. The law delineates what sin is. Again, Galatians 3 verse 19, Paul will ask the question, why the law then? His answer, it was added because of transgressions. Later on, he'll go on to say, kind of redundantly, it was to make sin appear to be exceedingly sinful. It was to point out it's very specifically wrongdoing. And so the law regulates behavior. The law establishes clear boundaries for conduct. The law delineates consequences for disobedience. The law identifies sin. What could the law not do? There are things the law did. What could the law not do? Well, first of all, it can change people's behavior, but not their hearts. God gives the children of Israel the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. For the next 40 years, they wander in the wilderness, don't they? Now, once God gave them the law at Sinai, did the people immediately turn around? Did they all come to believe? Did they all start obeying? Was everything just wonderful and hunky-dory from that point forward? Absolutely not. It was a mess. In fact, read it, everybody fundamentally over the age of 20 died in the wilderness in the next 40 years. That's hundreds of thousands of people who died. Why? Because their hearts didn't change. Now, did their behavior change? Yeah, I believe it did. Did they start observing Sabbath, for instance? Absolutely. Did, did they begin to keep the dietary laws and things like that? They certainly did. But did that change them on the inside? may have changed their behavior, but it, did it change them on the inside? No, it didn't. And you see, that's one of the problems, brethren, with law. Is law can change our behavior, but not change our heart. For years and years and years, it was illegal to gamble. And then it became legal to gamble. When it became illegal to gamble, a lot of people started gambling that hadn't gambled before. Why? Well, because it was changing their outward behavior, but not their heart. I mean, they were not not gambling because they had a real problem with gambling. They were, they were not gambling because gambling was illegal. You make gambling illegal, I'll gamble. You see all kinds of situations where that's the case right now, increasingly in states with marijuana. Wasn't necessarily the people who were abstaining from marijuana because they had some kind of deep felt conviction about it, heartfelt conviction. They were not doing it because it was illegal and they didn't want to go to jail. Well, now it's legal and so they'll use it. You see, law can change your behavior and not change your heart. That's critical. The law of Moses could change the behavior of the children of Israel. It didn't necessarily change what was going on inside them. Secondly, <laughs> that law could not, and this is important, that law could not justify. All the law could do was condemn. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Paul writes, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. 
Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. A little bit later, the writer of Hebrews will write in Hebrews 7, verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. Understand the purpose of law. The purpose of law is to regulate our behavior. Okay, the purpose of law is to draw parameters for our conduct, to delineate consequences. That's the purpose of law, all right? Here's the thing. Can law justify you? No, because when you're keeping the law, you're only doing what you ought to do in the first place. If you're driving through a school zone and the speed limit's 25, and you're driving through that school zone at 15, well, you ought to be. Because there are kids whose lives are at risk. And you're keeping the law because you ought to keep the law. I mean, they're not going to give you a medal because you drive slow through a school zone. You're not going to be rewarded for that because you're only doing what you should have done in the first place. But drive through that school zone at 35 miles an hour and what are you going to get? You're going to get a ticket. Why? Because the law condemns disobedience, doesn't it? And the law punishes disobedience. You see what the law is designed to do, and this is so important, please hear me. The law is designed to point out to you not your perfection, but your imperfection. The law is not designed to point out to you what you're doing well. The law is designed to point out to you what you're not doing well. The law is not designed to convince you that you're a success. Law is designed to show that you're a failure. Law is designed to force you to look at your conduct and to see and to acknowledge that your conduct doesn't measure up. Now you say, Dan, ouch, whoo, that's tough. Yes, it is. But that's why what we're going to talk about when we get to the grace of God and the gift of salvation through Christ is so incredibly important and so absolutely beautiful. Because you see, if we're trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, if we're trying to keep the law and somehow justify ourselves, what are we going to find? Ongoing, constant failure and frustration. That's what we're going to find. The law could not give life. The very commandment that promised life, Paul writes, proved death to me for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Later on in Hebrews 10, verse 3, the writer of Hebrews will speak of sacrifices as serving as a reminder of sins every year. Hebrews 10, verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. You see, what Paul recognized when he writes in Romans chapter 7, wretched man that I am, Rob referenced that earlier, was the fact that he looked at law and what he saw was his failure, not his success, his failure. He looked in the mirror and what he saw was a mess. He wasn't keeping the law. And what he found in looking at something that could bring life as it protected, instead, he says, brought death to me. Because he understood the consequences of breaking that law as being death. And so, this is very important. Brothers and sisters, what was the ultimate purpose of law? Why was the law given? If the law could not perfect, if the law couldn't save, what was the purpose of law? It was to point us to Jesus as our only hope for salvation. So then, Paul writes Galatians 3, 24 and 25. The law was our guardian, Pythagoras until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. 
But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. You go back to Sinai, you go back to the law of Moses, you go back to those hundreds of years from the giving of the law of Moses through Christ into the coming of the new covenant. And what was the purpose of all that? It was so God could show us you can't save yourself. When Jesus preached to the Pharisees, over and over again, what would he hammer on? He would hammer on the law, wouldn't he? You've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, but I tell you, don't even hate. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I tell you that every man who looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Here are these, here are these Pharisees who are picking and choosing laws. Trying to justify themselves. Read in the Sermon on the Mount. What are they emphasizing? They're emphasizing fasting. They're emphasizing tithing. They're emphasizing prayer. They're emphasizing Sabbath keeping. Around Luke 18, that, that Pharisee offering that prayer. God, aren't you lucky that I'm on your side? Look at what I'm doing. And look at this publican over here and what he does. And they're trying to justify themselves on the basis of picking and choosing laws. The fact of the matter is that if we look to law to save us, as one writer said, and I appreciated how he put it, he said, if you look to law to save you, you're either going to end up dishonest or a hypocrite. And that's true. If you look to law to save you, you're either going to end up dishonest or a hypocrite. Because when you confront the demands of law and what law requires of us, and our inability to deliver, that's what you're gonna be forced into. Now the problem again, the problem is not the law. Romans chapter seven, verse 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. But it'll go on to say in chapter eight, verse 13, that it is weakened by the flesh. Was the law of Moses perfect? It absolutely was. Who wasn't perfect? The people who tried to keep it. The problem was never the law. The problem has always been those striving to keep the law. Now, what does that mean for you and me today? It means that if Dan's trying to save himself by keeping the law, Dan's in trouble. Because Dan is never going to be able to keep the law perfectly. It means that what God is saying when he gives us that guardian, that Pythagoras, that mentor, that nanny, however you want to choose to translate that word used by Paul. What God is saying is, you must have Jesus. Salvation is going to come in his sacrifice. Salvation is gonna come by his blood. Salvation is gonna come as a gift to you received because of your faith. And in the next couple of three weeks, that's what I want us to look at. I want us to look at why, <laughs> brothers and sisters, let me tell you the gospel isn't just good news. The gospel's great news. Because the gospel is God's answer to your problem and mine. And your problem and mine is us. That's the problem. It's not God's laws, it's us. And that's why he sent Jesus to deal with the problem that we have by doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. And what that means is, that we have an incredible message of good news. That the New Testament is filled with an amazing message of good news. Mark starts his gospel by saying, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is, it is. And I think perhaps we haven't appreciated and understood just how good that news is, but I want us to. To embrace and understand the precious gift 
that God has given to us. And again, over the next couple of three weeks, we're going to be looking at that message and what it says about our relationship with God and what God has graced us with by his mercy. But when we start falling back on trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we fall into this trap of trying to be good enough, found worthy, we'll talk about, brethren, we're never going to be good enough. We are never going to be found worthy except in Christ. And that's why over and over again, as I want to point out to you, you read through the New Testament, there's two phrases you're going to see again and again. They're beautiful. One is the fact that Christ is in you and the other is that you are in Christ. And that is God's answer. And that's what it's all about. This morning, if you're not in Christ, if you haven't confessed your faith in him and put on your Lord in baptism, if you don't know the good news of freedom that comes, not because of our efforts, but because of his effort for us on the cross, because of our trust and faith in him. If you're ready to show him that trust and show him that faith, and give your life to him. If you can help you in any way, won't you come? While we stand and while we sing. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if his care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If your faith in the Savior has brought its reward, if the strength you have found in the strength of your Lord, if the hope of a tested palace is sweet, oh, will